You are listening to Lighthearted, the official podcast of the United States Lighthouse Society. My name is Jeremy Dontremont. Welcome. My co-host today is Cindy Johnson, Chapter Leadership Committee member of Friends of Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouses, a chapter of the American Lighthouse Foundation. Hi, Cindy. Hello, Jeremy. This is February 6th, 2022, and this is episode 159 of Lighthearted. We'll be listening shortly to the second part of a two-part interview with retired Coast Guard Rear Admiral Dan May, who had a long distinguished career as an ocean engineer for the Coast Guard. First, what's happened on this date in Lighthouse history, Cindy? Well, Jeremy, February 6th and 7th is the anniversary of the blizzard of 1978, one of the worst winter storms in U.S. history. The storm was especially bad for the New England coast. Boston got more than 27 inches of snow, and the storm was responsible for about 100 deaths and 4,500 injuries. At isolated Boone Island Light Station in southern Maine, Coast Guard keepers Kirby Eldridge and Leo Berry had to be rescued by helicopter on the second day of the storm. The damage to the keeper's house was so severe that a short time later, the Coast Guard demolished the house and automated the light. It was pretty incredible what those Coast Guard guys went through at Boone Island in that storm. If anyone wants to hear more about that, Kirby Eldridge was the guest on episode 125 of this podcast, and he described what happened there in detail. I remember that storm very well, like it was yesterday. Uh, I was going to Emerson College in Boston at the time. I was living at my family's home in Lynn, Massachusetts. Everything was shut down for about a week, and the busy road in front of our house had absolutely no traffic just a narrow path for walking in the middle of the street. The nice thing was that it was very quiet, the snow was beautiful, and people were very friendly and helpful to each other. I think that storm was a little before your time, Cindy. (laughs) That's right. I was just a little over two years old. I was also living in the Bay Area of California then. But I've heard a lot about it and seen some pretty incredible pictures. Yeah, I would say that was one of the two worst storms I've seen up close and personal, the other one being the, the famous perfect storm of October 91. I was in Winthrop, Mass. for that. But let's move on here. So let's introduce part two of our interview with Dan May. Retired Rear Admiral Daniel R. May graduated with a degree in ocean engineering from the U.S. Coast Guard Academy in 1979. He spent more than three decades working on many lighthouse-related projects from the Carolinas to Maine. In part two of the interview, we talk about a few more lighthouses Dan worked on, including Plum Island in New York and Lind Point in Connecticut. We also talked about his work on buoy-related projects, and we talk about uh, what he's doing in retirement. He's staying very busy. He's still involved with lighthouses. So let's listen to part two of my interview with Dan May now. So let's talk about some of the other lighthouse projects you're involved with. Uh, What about Plum Island, New York? Yeah, now that's a really interesting one. And I got to say, it ranks right up there in one of the most interesting, and I'll leave it in those terms that I've ever been. Of course, if you know a little bit of geography, Plum Island, uh, New York, there's a number of Plum Island lighthouses around the country. Plum Island, New York sits off the northeast point of the North Fork of Long Island, uh, Orient Point, due east of Orient Point. There's a little navigable waterway through there, hence you had a lighthouse. It, uh, Orient Point sits on the, the west side, Plum Island Lighthouse sat on the, and it, that little area they called Plum Gut. Mm-hmm. And the island, uh, much like a lot of U.S. history, there was a fort there, we, uh, Fort Terry was there during the early years and then up until World War II. After World War II, the uh, government took over the island and they uh, turned it into the animal disease research facility for the Department of Agriculture. It became a restricted island. You could not get on the island. Meanwhile, the Coast Guard still maintained the lighthouse. We had five Coast Guard personnel that were assigned to the station and lived there. And the uh, the only way you could get on the island was through either a boat from Orient Point or a boat from the southern part of Connecticut. And of course, the uh, erosion comes into this lighthouse as well. What had happened was in 1978, uh, again, part of the automation project, the, the Coast Guard took all the personnel off. And I 
did some research and I could not find much on this at all. But in February of 1978, the Coast Guard took all the people off. They extinguished the light. They put up a small lantern on an old oil house, which sat on the bluff. And that became the new Plum Island light. Well, fast forward 15 years, I come along. I'm at Civil Engineering Unit Providence, and we get uh, contacted by our Coast Guard uh, aids to navigation folks and say, hey, we've got a problem. That oil house is about two feet from the bluff, and it's going to go tumbling down here pretty soon. And we got to do something about the light. All the property, all the buildings had been transferred over to the Department of Agriculture. Coast Guard did not own anything. So I venture out there, and of course, you have to go through a lot of protocol to get out onto the island. You have to sign a lot of forms. Uh, it's amazing what you got to do to, to get onto the island. But I became good friends with the director out there. He welcomed me, gave me a lot of history, took me around the whole island. And then we took, took me, I brought another engineer with me and took me over to the lighthouse. And when we walked in the lighthouse, it was the most bizarre thing I had ever seen in my life of working on lighthouses. That lighthouse and everything in it had not been touched since February of 1978. Mm -hmm. And when I say nothing had been touched, I mean absolutely nothing. All the furniture, all the supplies, the kitchen, food, the pool table, the rack of balls were still on the table. The message board from February 1970, which every Coast Guard station kept the message board. It was updated daily. Message board still hanging on the wall. Wow. What an eerie feeling going through there. Yeah. So anyway, um, I spent some time over there. My ultimate solution for solving that was um, coming up with a piece of land safely back from the bluff that we could erect a, a skeleton tower and put up a new modern optic. Uh, and that's what I ended up doing. It took about a year working through. I had to lease land back from the Department of Agriculture. I had to make many, many trips out to the island, go through that same process every time of agreeing to be quarantined. That was one of the stipulations. If you were exposed to anything while you were on the island, you would have to agree to be uh, quarantined and all these things. But um, it was an interesting project. And uh, luckily today, there's there are some groups involved that were trying to uh, get the light. I'm not sure if they'll ever get it open to the public. They were hoping to get that open to the public. But yeah. just another one of those interesting uh, Coast Guard lighthouses that I had the, uh, the challenge of working with. Well, it's one I photographed from the water a few times, so I've never been on the island. Uh, as you said, it's mostly been pretty difficult to get on that that island. Beautiful building, very similar to yeah, yeah. Uh, granite granite structure yeah. building, and uh, just a, a the original fourth order lens still in the tower. Mm. It was a beautiful, beautiful sight, and I I see it mm. every time I take the ferry back and forth. And uh, hopefully, maybe one of these days, we we'll get the right organization in, we might be able to get that one open to the public because it is just a beautiful spot. Hopefully. Very similar to Block Island North, Light, North. Rhode yeah. Island, uh, Sheffield Island Light, Connecticut, and a few others. Uh, these people might be familiar with those. So uh, let's talk a little bit about Lind Point Lighthouse, also known as the Saybrook uh, Inner Light in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. Uh, I understand you uh, were involved with a the project there for a while. And one of the things uh, I'm interested in is there was a very uh, famous person who used to live right, right near there, near the lighthouse. I think you may have had some experience with her. Yes, Jeremy. I, again, uh, one of the things I learned early on in, in my uh, work on Lighthouse, you will always meet the nicest people at Lighthouses. And it's true to this day. Everywhere that I've been, I've always met some of the nicest people. So uh, we were working on um, Lynn Point Light, beautiful octagon tower and lighthouse right there at the mouth of the Connecticut River in Old Saybrook. And to get to the lighthouse, there's a little duplex there. Some Coast Guard uh, personnel lived in that little duplex. Yeah. To get to that lighthouse site, you had to drive through this very exclusive uh, residential area along the shore of Connecticut. And of course, Catherine Hepburn was one of the residents there. During our time on the project, um, I would look out occasionally and over on the beach, I would see a 
rather stately uh, woman walking her dog on the beach. I would always wave, she would always wave back. And um, as I was uh, wrapping up the project uh, one day, I was leaving, driving through the little area, one of the caretakers for one of the houses there came over and flagged me down. And I uh, stopped, rolled down the window and he said, I just want you to know, this is Catherine Hepburn's house and she's really enjoying all the work you're doing the lighthouse, it's her favorite lighthouse. And she just wanted me to come over and pass along how appreciative she is of uh, all the work you're doing for the Coast Guard. So I, mm. I thanked him and told him to let her know and off I went. But a couple of days later, I got to thinking and I said, you know what, I've got a, I had taken a couple of good pictures of Lynn Point. So I took one of the shots I had taken on an early morning, uh, good sunlight, and I had it uh, blown up to a nice eight by 10 photograph. And I put it in a frame, I wrapped it all up. And on my last trip down to Lynn Point, I drove by, I saw the uh, caretaker and said, uh, hey, would you mind? I put a little note on it and I said, would you mind giving this to Miss Hepper? And he said, oh, I certainly will. And of course I thought that was the end of it. I thought she would just enjoy having a nice picture of Lynn Point hanging on her wall. Well, about a month or two later, uh, I get mail one day and sure enough, I open the mail. It's a handwritten letter and she accompanied it with a little photograph of herself from Catherine Hepburn, thanking me for the photograph of her favorite lighthouse. And it's hanging on my wall here. Uh, sadly, she's no longer with us, but it just, um, as I said, points out, you meet the nicest people at lighthouses. Wow, that's quite a story. She, uh, her house, I believe, was was right next to the uh, Saybrook Breakwater light. So yeah, short yeah. distance away from Lynn Point, yeah. Um, just a little uh, side story related to, to that before we move on. Uh, about at least 10 years ago now, maybe 15, my wife and I went down to Essex, Connecticut, which is in that same area. Oh, yeah, beautiful town. Connecticut River. And uh, a man, the man that owned the actual boat, the African Queen that was used in the movie, wow. had it. he mostly had it in Florida, but he brought it up for a couple of seasons to Essex and he was giving public rides on it. My wife and I rode on the African Queen, which was a, an actual old steamboat, river steamboat, that chugged along on a hot July day. It was, it was so hot on that wow. boat, but it was great. And he told us that he kept trying to get Catherine Hepburn to come over because she <laughs> lived close by to yeah. come and, and maybe take a ride on the boat. He said she got as far as the dock and looked at it and said, yep, that's the African queen, all right, or something like that. But he couldn't get her to go on the boat. Go on but, the boat. That's amazing. What a story. Wow. Yeah, but I was pretty excited to actually be on the African queen. Yeah. So uh, let's talk a little bit about Watch Hill Light, Rhode Island. What was your involvement there? Yeah, again, Watch Hill, a beautiful place for a lighthouse, beautiful piece of land there, a little spit that sticks out into uh, the sound there that you get to see Fisher's Island Sound to the to the west and Block Island Sound to the south and the entrance to Narragansett Bay. But uh, I worked on a couple of projects there. Again, a great group of uh, folks from the Historical Society there that we had partnered with. And um, not uncommon storms come into that location as well. So I did one small revetment, no, nowhere near the size of uh, the revetment at Montauk, but I designed a small revetment there, still standing as far as I know, that protecting the light. But one of my many trips down to Watch Hill Light, I was able to meet the uh, son. Of course, he was now well into his 70s, but he was the son of the keeper from 1938. And in 1938, of course, we didn't have names for hurricanes back then, but the hurricane of 38 came into Rhode Island. Uh, terrible, terrible devastation. Six, 700 people were killed. Thousands and thousands of homes destroyed. And what he was sharing with me was that his family, his father being the keeper, they had to maintain the light and they stayed in the house at first, but then the water surge started approaching and they actually went up in the tower. And he remembers being in the tower watching. They were there for two days and didn't come back down till after the water had subsided. And that's when they discovered the devastation. So uh, I was just amazed to hear the story uh, firsthand from someone who lived through that experience. And yeah. uh, just amazing. I interviewed a couple who were there for the hurricane of 54, which was Hurricane Carol. Oh. That's after they started naming them. 
another one of the worst hurricanes in New England history. And the guy who was the Coast Guard keeper at the time talked about being in the fog signal building as the hurricane struck and the, said it was throwing uh, rocks the size of wow. softballs against the building and battering it. And he made a run to the keeper's house and they wrote it out in the second floor of the, the house. And everything was basically okay, but what a place to be in a hurricane. So of course, uh, this is a podcast about lighthouses, you know that, but you did a lot of other things in your career as an ocean engineer with the Coast Guard. Uh, maybe we could talk a little bit about some of the interesting things you did related to buoys. Absolutely. As an ocean engineer, you're going to get involved in design and uh, maintenance work on buoys. Buoys are just structured, but they float rather than being fixed on the water. So during my career, I got involved in a lot of different buoy uh, design, uh, buoy repairs, uh, saving buoys, you name it, I was involved in it. Uh, I think one of my most challenging projects was buoys was, uh, and I know Jeremy, you're very familiar as well as a lot of your listeners with Great Lakes. So uh, I was working in a partnership with a Coast Guard office that was responsible for uh, one of the things that this country discovered as the Coast Guard automated lighthouses, we took the personnel off. One of the things those personnel did every hour of every single day was take weather observations. The weather service started seeing huge holes in their database and they were concerned about that. So we were able to design a package, uh, an automated remote package that we could put on buoys. We could put it also on lighthouses to capture real-time weather data. So I was working out of that office doing a lot of design. We had buoys that were out in Hawaii and 18,000 feet of water. I designed moorings for them. I designed other buoys, but the weather service came to us one, one year. And the way the weather service worked the buoys in the Great Lakes was they put the buoys out. We had, each lake had several buoys, including Lake Superior, the northernmost uh, and the deepest of all the Great Lakes most challenging weather conditions of all the Great Lakes. So we would put the buoys out in the, in the springtime and then before the lakes froze, typically November, December, we'd haul them out, but the, let the lakes ice over and then go back in the spring. So the weather service said, hey, we want a buoy that's gonna go year round, quite the challenge. So uh, we took it on and we used one of these, uh, what's affectionately known as a monster buoy they're uh, 40 foot diameter, uh, several tons. Uh, they were used for large navigational buoys uh, during the Coast Guard days. But we took one of those buoys um, and we took it up to Lake Superior and I designed a mooring for it that would allow the buoy to move during the ice. But then when the ice subsided, it would re-moor itself. Uh, it was this intricate mooring system. Mm. It worked absolutely as designed perfectly, uh, the weather service loved it. And uh, one of the benefits, I'm not sure if I can call it a benefit, but one of the benefits of the project, they flew me up in the middle of the winter and I got to fly out <laughs> over the buoy in, uh, in ice. And uh, I also got to see a couple of lighthouse standard rock, which I, mm -hmm. I know you're familiar with and a lot oh, yeah. of your listeners are. Um, I saw an ice shelf 25 to 30 feet high uh, on along the side of Standard Rock in the middle of Whitefish Bay uh, just gave me an unbelievable appreciation for wintertime in the Great Lakes. Yeah, wow. Yeah, Standard Rock, I think, is considered the most isolated lighthouse in the country. It is. It is. Amazing place. Yeah. So you were, uh, over the years, involved with a, a lot of uh, conversions of lighthouses to solar power and the installation of uh, so-called modern optics, uh, replacing the old Fresnel lenses in many of these places. One of the, the lights you were involved with, the uh, light stations was Mount Desert Rock. Some people say Mount Desert, some say Mount Desert. I don't know where you come down on that, but uh, it is uh, another one of the most isolated lighthouses in the country. It's more than 20 miles offshore uh, in the uh, Acadia region of Maine. I was on Mount Desert Rock Light once, and I always say it was like being in another planet because you can't even <laughs> see the mainland from there or anything else. Good it really, description. Yeah, it really felt like that to me. So what, what was your experience like with, with that? Yeah, same, same as your Jerry. You really feel like you're in the middle of nowhere, 30-some uh, miles off the coast of Maine uh, in the Gulf of Maine on a rock, and it is nothing more than a rock there. 
but uh, it was uh, probably one of the hardest uh, logistically. And throughout most of my projects that I worked on lighthouses, we were so fortunate to have Coast Guard boats, Coast Guard helicopters. Sometimes they weren't available because they were doing the day-to-day -day Coast Guard mission, but we relied on them as much as possible. And sometimes when they weren't available, we had to hire uh, boats or helicopters, uh, but it was quite challenging. And, and that one probably, uh, as you pointed out, is one of the most remote and isolated spots on the whole East Coast. And it was quite a challenge, but we did a lot of work out there. And um, it's good to see the lighthouse in great shape. Yeah, uh, taken care of, owned by the College of the Atlantic now. And they use it as a yeah. marine mammal research station. Uh, it's pretty, pretty neat what they do there. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Isles of Shoals Light Station, also known as White Island Light, which is near me here off the New Hampshire seacoast, the southernmost of the, uh, the island group called the Isles of Shoals. I believe it was uh, converted to solar power in 93, 1993. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. And um, it, we got involved because of the perfect storm we, we talked about earlier. And um, I also have to mention, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, with a civilian working with Charlie Baines down the 5th District, when I came to New England and uh, worked for CU Promet, I was again blessed to have a great civilian gentleman by the name of Harry Duvall. Harry lives in Maine now, fully retired, great guy. Harry and I became the two guys that worked on all the automation and all the lighthouse projects and, and the repairs. And we were much like Charlie and, my, and, uh, and myself, Harry and I were the same way. It didn't matter day or night, cold or wet, uh, we were always there. Helicopter, boat, you name it, we, we went in it. Peapod as well. And uh, so I had a great time working with Harry. That perfect storm, had done so much damage. Uh, in fact, uh, we mentioned about when I was at Montauk. During my time at Montauk, I received a phone call from the Coast Guard office uh, back in Rhode Island that said, hey, you need to get back because we have a helicopter waiting for you the next day to go up and down the east coast of Maine and, and Massachusetts to see the damage from the storm to our lighthouses. In fact, for the first time in 40 some years, the ferry from Orient was not running that day. So not only did I have to get back, I had to drive all the way to New York City and then back out to get home. It was a very long day, but I was in a helicopter the next day flying up and down the coast and I was just unbelievable sight to see the damage. Isla Shoals was probably the worst. The entire engine generators, fuel tanks, all the automated completely gone. Mm. and the interesting thing about it was there was no evidence that it had ever been there. It was like these massive waves had destroyed everything. And then as the storm subsided, it washed it clean. So we were faced with, okay, what do we do now? And at that time, technology had caught up to where we could produce a light with a DC lamp that could be powered via solar panels. And we wouldn't have to use these big diesel engine generators and fuel tanks and everything. So environmentally, it was a great solution for the environment and also for us from a technology. So we made the decision to go to solar and uh, that was the first major landfall light uh, to go to solar in the Coast Guard. And uh, the gentleman I just mentioned, Harry Duvall became my right hand man and we uh, set out to do Isla Shoals, Boone Island, Halfway Rock, Mount Desert Rock, most all of these sites that had been uh, heavily damaged, we converted all over to solar over the next two or three years and eventually got them all done. But it was quite the undertaking. Yeah. I met uh, Harry Duvall in uh, 2001, June 2001, when I took a helicopter ride with uh, CWO Dave Waldrop, who I think oh, you, yes. you know, was the lighthouse <laughs> manager for the district for a while. Uh, to Graves Light in Boston Harbor while that was being solarized and Harry was there with the team. Wow. Uh, that was quite an experience landing a little postage stamp uh, oh, yeah. landing place say, at Graves Light. You saw firsthand, Jeremy, trying to land that thing. Absolutely, but it was, it was a great experience. Uh, speaking of the solar panels at White Island Light, you know what eventually happened to that yeah. large solar array there? Oh, unfortunately, a big storm. I think it was April of 2007. That's I exactly, found yeah. Later on, that it had been destroyed. And I would have bet that there would never have been a storm that could have destroyed that array. It was just massive. And we 
purposely designed it for storm surge to flow underneath it. So right. Uh, that had that to was be a massive a storm. Massive storm, April of 2007. I photographed waves hitting the rocks at Whaleback Lighthouse in that same area, the mouth of the Piscataqua River there, going 70, more than 70, 80, probably 80, 90 feet up in the air. The oh, lighthouse is 70 feet wow. and the water just going way up wow. above the lighthouse in that same storm. The walkway, the covered walkway between the house and tower at White Island was also destroyed in that, that same storm. Wow. You uh, were certainly involved in other lighthouse projects besides the one we've, ones we've talked about today. We don't have time to talk about all of them, but I'm wondering if there's maybe one or two others that just pop into your memory at this point. There's a, there's a bunch. I think one of the ones that is just, again, I'll use the term interesting, um, is Execution Rocks, which sits down in the western end of uh, Long Island Sound at the entrance to the East River, getting into this, uh, New York City. And um, I had a number of projects there. There was a storm again, uh, came in and destroyed uh, much of the old fog signal building. And we also solarized execution rocks, but I spent a good number of trips down on execution rock. And um, of course the name in itself gives you a little bit of uh, intimidation when you go there. <laughs> there is a legend behind that. I don't know if it's, a tr if it's true, but it's an interesting legend. Yeah. yeah. And I, I've heard the same stories. Either the, the British used it as a site for uh, executing prisoners by chaining them to the rocks at low tide, letting uh, Mother Nature uh, accomplish their, uh, their execution by uh, bringing in the high tide, or that perhaps because of the many shipwrecks it had been uh, named. I, I don't know if either one are true. I really don't know. But I do know that I always got an eerie feeling anytime I was at that site. Mm. There was a couple occasions where uh, Harry and myself were there and Harry was down uh, working on some of the electronics. I was up in the structure doing some work and I would feel like someone was present and I would turn around and say, Harry. And of course, Harry was not there. Uh, as far as I could tell, no one else was there either. Mm -hmm. But I just had this eerie, <laughs> eerie as far thing. as you could tell, anyway. Yeah, yeah. So uh, those are all interesting. I've been out to uh, New London Ledge, which has some some stories behind it. Uh, uh, Sandy Hook, a number of others. Um, I did a number of projects on the Hudson River, which I always thought was fascinating. The uh, we've got four lighthouses there on the Hudson River. Uh, I think you've done a podcast with uh, one or two of those. Uh, Hudson yeah, I also wrote a book on Hudson River Lighthouses. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. But I, I always thought those were fascinating lighthouses, beautiful architecture. And so they're very unique in their nature, but uh, love, love working on projects on those. Absolutely. You were involved in the genesis of the main lights program in the 1990s. How did that get started? Yeah, and again, it's interesting. I think sometimes I just happen to be in the right place at the right time. And in uh, around 1993, 94 timeframe, I uh, was still at the, the Civil Engineering Unit in Rhode Island. They also, besides maintenance and engineering work, they were responsible for what we call real property or the actual transfer leases, licenses, those sort of things. And of course, we worked with a lot of lighthouse groups, but I was placed in charge of that section along with uh, my other lighthouse engineering duties and I had a, a great attorney that worked for me uh, by the name of Ted Dernago. And Ted and I uh, thought a lot alike. We were very committed to long-term preservation. We, that's what our goal was. And so we saw that the Coast Guard had a major problem in lighthouse maintenance work. We just didn't have enough money and the automation process, as we all know, as engineers, the worst thing you can do for a house is close it up. Uh, houses need to breathe, structures need to breathe. And so by automating these structures over these years, we were kind of doing a disservice to the structures themselves. And then of course, all the storms and everything that had just through uh, the 90s, 80s and 90s had done damage. So. The more we talked about it and the more we worked with lighthouse groups, we, we thought that the solution was ultimately to transfer the properties to nonprofit groups who could accept grants, donations, do fundraising, things that the Coast Guard could not do. 
And the more we thought about it, we thought this is the long-term solution we've been thinking about, hoping for, for years to come. So as we started working on this, a lighthouse up in Penobscot Bay by the name of Heron Neck came up. Heron Neck, beautiful lighthouse, Greens Island off the coast of Vinyl Haven, one of the most picturesque spots uh, in all of Maine. Yeah. Unfortunately, had a fire in the late 80s and was in a state of ruin. And along came a gentleman by the name of Peter Ralston with the Island Institute. And they were hoping to license it from us. They had a contractor that was willing to go out, totally restore the building and get it back to where it needed to be. And so the more we got talking about it with Peter Ralston and with the Island Institute, this whole concept of transfer came to light. And as we started working it, uh, Senator Mitchell, uh, then Senator from Maine got involved and said, hey guys, why don't we do not one or two, let's do as many as we can. Mm -hmm. So with that backdrop, uh, Ted and I and Harry, we all got to work and we put together 33 lighthouse properties that became the legislation and basically called the Maine Lights Program. Senator Mitchell introduced it, it was approved, and that began the process. And uh, uh, of course, now today we have the uh, NHLPA, which was based on that. I had the pleasure of hosting uh, Congressman Souter, who, who came up with that legislation. He did it based on the Maine Lights Program. So that mm -hmm. was really the uh, blueprint for going forward and uh, what we have today. Definitely, yeah. The, for people who might not know, the National Historic Lighthouse Preservation Act of 2000, you're referring to, definitely uh, Maine Lights Program was the model for that. Uh, I've been to Heron Neck Lighthouse, which you mentioned, uh, beautifully restored. Uh, the couple that lives there now does a great job taking care of it. It's really a, a absolutely gorgeous place. Yeah, and so, that's, great. that's great to hear. And yeah. I uh, have one, one, one of my favorite photographs is uh, Harry and I had to get the final data to make that transfer go and we went out on a snowy day in November and I have a picture of Harry and I uh, I think we rode in a little pea pod which is a little rowing craft that keepers had we still had a few of those around in Maine and we towed one out via a Coast Guard boat and then uh, rode in but uh, it was the kind of weather we were used to working in but I, I think back now had we not made that trip and had we not been able to accomplish that it could have at least delayed, if not prevented, the whole uh, thing from going forward. So mm -hmm. uh, we were very fortunate to have been able to do that. That's such a beautiful part of the world, the whole Penobscot Bay region. Love it. Love it around there. You mentioned being at Montauk uh, just recently. In fact, uh, we were, you and I were corresponding a bit while you were at Montauk. So you were doing some consulting there. Uh, is, is that something you're doing uh, often in your retirement or supposed retirement? I am. I, I still love lighthouses. When I retired from the Coast Guard in late 2012, I went to work for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for about six or seven years and then just retired from that here in 2019. And I've uh, renewed a lot of my lighthouse contacts and uh, it's a, a labor of love as it always has been. So I just enjoy helping other folks. And one of the things uh, that I've come to realize after 35 years of work in lighthouses and in that environment that uh, I'm one of the few folks around that have a lot of knowledge and expertise just for the fact that I'm still around. And so if I can help anybody in any way, I'm, I'm always uh, grateful to be able to do that. So I'm, I'm working with, uh, with the Montauk folks and uh, hopefully if, if others uh, need some help, I'm always willing to help out if I can in some way. Yeah. Well, that's a great thing for for everybody, for you and everybody you're you're helping. I should uh, I'm going to give uh, our listeners a little bit of a scoop here. Okay, uh, you have written a manuscript of a book on your Coast Guard career, uh, covering a lot of the things we talked about today and more. And uh, we're going to be working together to to publish that book. I'm hoping it'll be within the next year, and it's exciting. And uh, that's. In case people are wondering, how did I know the questions to ask? That <laughs> that manuscript was, a, I mean, I knew something about your career, but the, the having the manuscript to refer to was certainly uh, a big help in preparing questions for this interview. But uh, I think people really enjoy reading about your uh, more detail about your career. 
No, that's great, Jeremy, and uh, very exciting. I mean, what what else do you do during a pandemic? I probably yeah. read uh, no less than 25 or 30 books. And um, I also finally uh, had some time to dig through some of my old photographs. And I came up with this idea to um, uh, to write a lighthouse book. It's called Preserving America's Lighthouses. And I am very uh, honored and excited to be working with you and the U.S. Lighthouse Society to uh, get that published this year. And uh, I'll uh, let our readers enjoy that hopefully later this year. Uh, I've also um, worked on a um, leadership book and I've got that just about done. I'm hoping perhaps we'll, we'll get that to uh, the publication this year or next as well. But uh, I just in love, uh, I've been very blessed and uh, have enjoyed a great career. And I've learned so much from so many uh, talented people, uh, including yourself and others that are out there. And so I just enjoy uh, sharing those stories of the things that I've learned during my life. Well, I'm really glad you are uh, sharing them. And I'm sure you heard people say over the years, you should write a book about all this. <laughs> I have, I have. Now yeah. I've done it. And anybody who said that to you was absolutely right. So I'm, I'm really glad you did. So people should watch for that again, yeah, to be published by the U.S. Lighthouse Society upcoming. It's going to be uh, very exciting to get that that out, out there. So uh, we mentioned at the beginning, you live in Newburyport uh, now, uh, Newburyport, Mass., uh, which for people who don't know is the northern Massachusetts coast, uh, kind of near the border with uh, New Hampshire. You have a lighthouse there in Newburyport, the Newburyport Harbor Light, also known as Plum Island Light, a different Plum Island Light than we talked about earlier uh, at the northern tip of Plum Island, a uh, very beautiful island there. Uh, have you had any involvement with that lighthouse since you've been living in that area? I have, and that was, again, one of the many reasons that drew us back to this area. In the uh, mid-90s, uh, again, when we were working with many lighthouse groups, um, there was a group of folks uh, called themselves the Friends of Plum Island Light, and a great lady, sadly no longer with us, Barbara Keezer, started yeah. that group. And she approached uh, the Coast Guard and said, boy, we'd love to license this from you. We, we want to open it up for tours and we want to help in the maintenance. And so we did. We worked with Barbara. We got her a license. We got her going. And I personally uh, got to come up and spend the good days there. Then in 2001, when I came back as the group commander, of course, Barbara and her group were still there. And she approached me and said, you know, we love this so much, we'd love to acquire the lighthouse. And so uh, the mayor at the time of Newburyport, Al Lavender, sadly Al died in a plane crash, no longer with us, but Al, uh, great mayor, uh, great steward of uh, lighthouses said, let's, let's see if we can work this out. And so Congressman Tierney at the time was a, a good friend and we since the Lighthouse Act had not uh, had just come into place, there weren't procedures for it. We were kind of in limbo. And Congressman Tierney came along and said, hey, let me help out. We'll transfer this to the city of Newburyport, who will then sign a 99-year lease with the Friends of Plum Island Light. And that's how it is today. And since I've retired here, I spend a lot of time out there. I go out and help with the other volunteers and we just decorated it up for Christmas. We had it as part of our house tour here and it's just a great relationship. I, I think it falls into that category. As I stated earlier, you meet the nicest people at Lighthouses and it continues to be true to this day. And I, I enjoy working with the folks out there so much. I know Jeremy, you've spent a lot of time out there. It is a, a picturesque, uh, quaint little lighthouse that marks the entrance to the Merrimack River there. Yeah, it is. It's one of the few uh, 19th century wooden lighthouses still standing in this country. Uh, it's really quite, quite handsome. And I, I knew Barbara Keezer well, who you mentioned, who started that group, the Friends of Plum Island Light. Her grandfather, George Keezer, was a keeper there. Yeah, and uh, she was yeah. extremely dedicated to that place. And also just one more note on that. I was there at that transfer ceremony when ceremony. it was transferred to yeah. the city. Yeah. And uh, I think you're in some of the photos. I, yeah, I took you shared that day. some of those. I mean, that was great, Jeremy, and awesome that you were you were there. It uh, mm -hmm. was a, was a great day, and uh, absolutely crystal clear blue sky. Great day for for everyone involved, and it's uh, turned out to be a great relationship. Yep. Yeah. So I have uh, two final questions for you, and these are for bonus points. All right. So 
So get your thinking cap on, get your number two pencil ready. First, uh, how do you, well, this is a two-part, the first of the last two questions is a two-part question. How do you see the present and future of lighthouse preservation in this country? And part two of that is, are you optimistic about the future? Well, it's interesting, um, you know, having been involved with this for more than three decades, uh, in those early years, we had a lot of momentum. And, and the late 80s, early 90s, uh, with the Main Lights program, uh, I went to so many different um, lighthouse gatherings, conventions. Uh, people asked me to come and speak all over the country. And I felt so excited uh, with all this enthusiasm and we had so much success in the programs. Then it kind of waned a little bit and I uh, haven't seen that amount of energy and enthusiasm as I saw then, but it seems to be coming back. And now that uh, I'm getting more involved in, in various things around the country, I see a lot more momentum, a lot more enthusiasm. So I am very optimistic and I think we've also uh, created a second generation. You're seeing much younger folks now, which is what we need to be involved. And um, these structures have stood the test of time for hundreds of years, generation after generation. And I just want those to be able to can continue so that our children, our grandchildren, and those beyond can continue to enjoy them as we have. And so I'm very excited. I'm very optimistic that we, we are going to see a new wave of folks coming on to ensure the long-term stewardship of these structures. Yeah, well, let's, let's certainly hope so. And final question, what has, and you can give more than one, uh, name more than one thing, but what has been your favorite thing or things about being involved with lighthouses and other aids to navigation over the years? Well, that's a tough one, but I, <laughs> it really, it's the challenge. And I'm one of these guys, I was this way as a, as a young kid growing up. And, uh, and when I set off to go to the Coast Guard Academy, never in my wildest dreams did I ever envision, envision that I would have the career that I had. Uh, truly blessed in every way, but I never shied away from any challenge. There were many people that when I took on project after project would tell me, oh, that's never gonna happen. Or even the Boston Light we talked about earlier. A uh, number of people told me, uh, no, Senator Kennedy was never going to let you take people off Boston Light. Never going to happen. So I think the challenge and then Mother Nature uh, is a formidable foe. And I always envisioned uh, a challenge with Mother Nature as an ocean engineer. Could I design something? Could I create something that's going to withstand the... Uh, the forces of malaria. I've been successful in some, maybe some, not so much, but uh, the challenge, that's, that's all. And the journey along the way, that's what motivates me. That's what, uh, that's what keeps me going. Beautifully said. Dan May, it's such a pleasure to, to talk to you today. And, uh, you know, you and I have known each other a long time. We've, we know a lot of the same people. We certainly love a lot of the same lighthouses. That's, that's for sure. Absolutely. Uh, and like I mentioned before, we're almost the same age. I think we have a lot in, a lot in common, but um, I've admired your, your work for, for so long. And people are going to be hearing this as two parts in the podcast. We've talked for nearly two hours. I know we could talk for several more hours to cover all the, the projects, but what people will be getting a chance to read more about it in the, your uh, book that will be uh, coming uh, in the not-too-distant future, as we talked about. So again, uh, Dan, I hope we can talk again. I'm sure we'll talk again sometime, but I really appreciate you spending this time with me today. Thank you, I'm Dan. sure we will, Jeremy. The feeling is mutual. I've admired you uh, and all the things that you've been able and that you continue to do, especially with these podcasts. And um, I'm going to take a little uh, break here for the winter and head down to Florida. Thank you again, Dan. Great talking to you today. Same here, Jeremy. Thanks so much. Toward the end of the interview, Dan talked about his involvement with the Friends of Plum Island Light in Newburyport, Massachusetts. Plum Island Light has had no public open houses for the past two seasons because of the COVID pandemic, but the grounds at the northern tip of Plum Island are always open. And visitors to Newburyport can also see a pair of range lighthouses downtown as well as the Custom House Maritime Museum. Right, Newburyport is one of my favorite cities and it's just a half hour south of where I live here in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. 
I want to thank Dan May again for the interview. I thoroughly enjoyed it. As always, thanks to everyone associated with the U.S. Lighthouse Society and its chapters and affiliates. Check out uslhs.org to learn more about everything the organization offers. And remember that memberships and donations help to support this podcast as well as the Society's Preservation Grant Program. If you listen to this podcast on a platform that allows you to post reviews, please rate and review us. And please spread the word about the podcast on social media. The creed of the United States Coast Guard includes these lines, quote, I shall live joyously, but always with due regard for the rights and privileges of others. I shall endeavor to be a model citizen in the community in which I live, unquote. And the motto of the Coast Guard is Semper Paratus, which means always ready. In almost 40 years of being involved with lighthouses, I've had a lot of interaction with the Coast Guard over the years. I have complete respect for the men and women of the Coast Guard, and I think it's the most underappreciated branch of our military. They do so much for us on a daily basis. So to all my Coast Guard friends, bravo Zulu. And to everyone, thanks so much for listening and keep a good light. Out in the dark, I'm gonna let it shine. Out in the dark, I'm gonna let it shine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine